This year marks the year that Keiji Muto finally would retire from pro wrestling. The multiple-time world champion and icon of the pro wrestling industry had entertained millions for decades, but this was the year that he finally stepped away from the ring. Muto is as decorated as a wrestler can aspire to be. Over the course of his long career, he has been everything from a booker to a company president, and his impact is one that will never be forgotten in pro wrestling. Of course, everyone has to start from somewhere, but from quite early on in his career, Muto had a lot of expectations put on him, and it was clear from the very beginning he would either prosper or be crushed as a result. With this in mind, Muto had to solve the question of what he would need to do that would make him the icon of the industry he knew he could be. Part of figuring this out was traveling across the planet. While he was a young man, Muto traveled to the States on excursion. He simply went by the name The White Ninja, and in his very first stop against Denny Brown in Florida, he showed he had what it takes. He instantly wowed audiences with his offense, but it wasn't until he linked up with a man named Gary Hart that he would find the character that would propel him into superstardom. Now some of the people that I've had problems with in the past, they show up in Atlanta, Georgia, the Big Apple of the South, the place that's rocking and rolling. Give us whoever, because the Boogeyman, the great Kabuki, is returning to the Omni. And then once uh, Jimmy Crockett sold his business uh, to Turner, uh, Al found me left, and uh, they asked if I could create another Kabuki. And I said, well, I can't create a Kabuki, but I can create something similar. Right. And they said, well, who would, who would you get to do this? And I had known Duke Kiyomuka for many, many years since Texas. Well, actually, since Texas. I wrestled him in Texas as a young boy. Uh, and uh, Paxson and then the great Kabuki. Uh, and they said, we got a boy named the great Muta, which is Muta. And I said, yeah, I know him. I saw him on World Class. He was in World Class. Muta had been around a while. But it had never really been packaged or given any direction. So I got in touch with him, uh, much of them, the Florida in touch with me. And uh, I took him around to towns here in the Carolinas, just small towns, no big towns. I showed him some tapes of the Great Kabuki. And uh, I told him, I, I want you not to be the Great Kabuki, I want you to be similar. And I want to present you as the son of the great Kabuki, but I'm not going to tell everyone that in the beginning. I'm going to wait. Now, I don't want you to be mean and evil like the Kabuki. I want you to be like a superhero with a bad guy. Because my biggest fear was I didn't want people to think I'm copying myself of the great Kabuki. I wanted to make the Muda completely opposite, similar but opposite. And uh, he, he became the great Muda really, really quickly and did tremendous business, a great kid. After being several different shades of ninja, this meeting with Gary Hart would give Muta more of a direction with his character. The character became known as the Great Muta, and he quickly got over in the States and Japan. Muto used his high flying to set his character apart from the Kabuki, and it worked wonders. But quickly, a problem became clear. The great Kabuki being the character's father would limit some of the stories they could tell with both characters. The continued the spirit of the concept by saying Kabuki had mentored Muta, but they severed the relation of the characters. This was quickly remedied with a new backstory for the character. The great Muta's new backstory was that it was simply a demon that would possess the body of Muto. It was risky, but the crowds got behind it and this character accepted by the masses. He was accepted to such a degree that he was the subject of a short monster movie. The film begins with a long walk in a cave where you see the great Muta spring to life from an egg.
Lucky for us all, he was birthed in full wrestling garb. He wanders through the cave for a while, having some clips of his matches blink in a few times. Until he gets to a spot in the cave where he can see a figure. The figure is revealed to basically look like one of the monsters from the Giver movies. Which makes sense, because the creature designer for the film is Steve Wang, a famed artist who worked on both the Giver and the Predator franchises. Muda attempts to fight off the monster, and even though he got some good shots in, it's not long before the monster is able to lay waste to Muda. somewhat of a letdown if you wanted Muda to win off the bat, but this is where things get pretty great. The next part begins with Muda completely unconscious on the ground, but the moon lights up and resurrects him. As it seems, he may just go fight the monster again. He suddenly notices that he isn't finished with this resurrection and begins to transform. What follows is a pretty awesome transformation scene that is at least loosely inspired by the American werewolf in London transformation. This new version of Muta is substantially stronger and more frightening in appearance. He quickly hunts down the creature and is able to dispatch him in a very over-the-top and violent fashion. The demon form of Muta grabs the leg of the fallen monster to drag him off to eat him or something, and the credits begin to roll. If they wanted to make their change of Great Muta's backstory memorable, they certainly achieved that. The Great Muta is one of the most beloved wrestling characters of all time, and had a run that spanned over 30 years, and through all of it, he has made many different appearances in media outside of wrestling, but this one is probably my favorite. It was such a unique use of the character and different type of storytelling that it easily stands out. Creature features starring a pro wrestler is something that should probably make a comeback. New Japan certainly saw something in this aspect of showing their characters and seemed to have some pretty big plans involving this aspect of storytelling. During this time, a full-length two-hour movie was made about the character of Jushin Liger. Much like Muta Liger had gained a large amount of popularity not only in his home country of Japan, but around the world and with frequent stops in the States, even the most casual wrestling fans had heard of him. The character had been borrowed from a long-running anime somewhat like Tiger Mask, but unlike Tiger Mask, the wrestler was able to surpass the popularity of the source material. This opened up the avenue for another collaboration with Steve Wang to give the same treatment we saw with Muta to Jushin Liger. For whatever reason, these collaborations would come to a close. The cost was likely the reason, but for the time that we had it, these were extraordinary pieces of media. In the case of Muta, it is some of the footage that stands out more than any others. There is just something about it that, to me, makes it essential to the character. It is easy to see how things like this could be done today to enhance certain characters. A retelling of a few origin stories with this kind of twist could be an interesting way to go. A short film about the House of Black, Finn Balor, or even to finally have that fabled encounter between Sting and The Undertaker with this kind of twist on their characters just seems like such a fun idea that shouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. And lucky for us, Steve Wang is still out there.